Let's go. We're going to continue on here with uh, Tony Robbins' Money Mash of the Game. This is going to be chapter 5.3. Um, before I get started on this, one of the things I like about these videos that I'm doing, specifically with the Tony Robbins, sometimes I feel like I can say things on these videos because I don't think really anybody's paying attention. I could be wrong, but um, but sometimes just saying something out loud is kind of nice. And um, And it's just funny because with everything positive that's happened in my life, in the last couple of weeks that I've had to be like really excited about sometimes you just kind of sit back and and you just wish that there was that one person that you could celebrate with <clears throat> life's kind of crazy like that you know Chapter 5.3, Freedom, Creating Your Lifetime Income Plan. And I say that because it's like, what's money really? You know what I mean? Anyways. Lifetime income stream, key to retirement happiness. Time, July 30th, 2012. I have enough money to retire comfortably for the rest of my life. Problem is, I have to die next week. <laughs> okay I needed that one that, that was a good one <laughs> that, that was a good one thanks Tony he came through for me in 1952 Edmund Hillary led the first expedition to successfully climb Mount Everest a feat once thought to be impossible the Queen of England promptly knighted him, making him Sir Edmund Hillary for his amazing trek. Despite his accomplishment, many people believe Sir Edmund Hillary may not have been the first person to reach the peak of Everest. In fact, it is widely believed that George Mallory may have been the first person to reach the peak nearly 30 years prior. So if George Mallory reached the peak of Mount Everest in 1924, why did Hillary all receive all the fame, including being knighted by the Queen? Because Edmund Hillary didn't just make it to the peak, he also successfully made it back down the mountain. George Mallory was not so lucky. Like the vast majority of those who have died on Everest, it was coming down that proved fatal. Investing for what exactly? I often ask people, what are you investing for? The responses are wide and diverse. Returns, growth, assets, freedom, fun. Really do I hear the answer that matters most. Income. We all need an income that we can count on. Consistent cash flow that shows up in our account every single month like clockwork. Can you imagine never worrying again about how you will pay your bills or whether your money will run out? or having the joy and freedom of traveling without a care in the world. Not having to worry about opening your monthly statements and praying the market holds up. Having the peace of mind to give generously to your church or favorite charity and not wonder if there will be <clears throat> not wonder if there will be more where that came from. We all know intuitively income is freedom. Shout it from the hilltops like Mel Gibson in the movie Braveheart. Income is freedom, and lack of income is stress. Lack of income is struggle. Lack of income is not acceptable outcome for you and your family. Make this your declaration. Dr. Jeffrey Brown, retirement expert and advisor to the White House, said it best in a recent Forbes article. Income is the outcome that matters most for retirement security. The wealthy know that their assets, stocks, bonds, gold and so on will always fluctuate in value but you can't spend assets you can only spend cash 
The year 2008 was a time when there were lots of people with assets, real estate in particular, that were plummeting in price and they couldn't sell. They were asset rich and cash poor. This equation often leads to bankruptcy. Always remember that income is the outcome. By the end of this section, you will have the certainty and the tools you need to lock down exactly the income you desire. This is what I call income insurance, a guaranteed way to know for certain that you will have a paycheck for life without having to work for it in the future, to be absolutely certain that you will never run out of money. And guess what? You get to decide when you want your income checks to begin. There are many ways to skin the proverbial cat, so we will review a couple of different methods for getting the income insurance that makes sense for you. One of the more exciting structures for locking down income has another powerful benefit as well. It is the only financial vehicle on the planet that gives you the following. 100% guarantee on your deposits. You can't lose your money and you keep the total control. Upside without downside. Tax deferral on your growth, a guaranteed lifetime income stream where you have control and get to decide when to turn it on. Get this, the income payments can be made tax free if structured correctly and no annual management fees. You get all these benefits by using a modern version of a 2000 year old financial tool. How is it possible? I am sure it sounds too good to be true, but stick with me, it's not. I use this approach and I am excited to share the details with you. As we have highlighted throughout the book, the financial future that you envision is very much like climbing Mount Everest. You will work for decades to accumulate your critical mass climbing to the top, but that's only half the story. Achieving critical mass without having a plan and strategy for how to turn it into income that will last the rest of your lifetime will leave you like George Mallory, dead on the backside of a mountain. A new age. We are, without a doubt, in uncharted waters. In the past 30 years, the concept of retirement has transformed radically. Heck, even as recently as the late 80s, over 62% of workers had a pension plan. Remember those? On your last day of work, you got a gold watch and the first of your guaranteed lifetime income checks. Today, unless you work for the government, a pension is a relic, a financial dinosaur. Now, for better or worse, you are captain of your own ship. You are ultimately responsible for whether or not your money will last. That's quite a burden to bear. Throw in market volatility, excessive fees, inflation, and medical surprises, and you quickly start to understand why so many are facing a massive retirement crisis. Many people, including your neighbors and colleagues, are going to face the real likelihood of outliving their money, especially with the prospect of living longer than ever before. Is 80 the new 50? A long, fruitful retirement is a concept that's only a few generations old. If you recall from our discussion earlier when President Franklin Roosevelt created Social Security in 1935, the average life expectancy was just 62, and the payments wouldn't kick in until age 65, so only a small percentage would actually receive Social Security benefits to begin with. At the time, the Social Security made financial sense because there were 40 workers, contributors, for every retiree collecting benefits. That means there were 40 people pulling the wagon with only one sitting in the back. By 2010, the ratio had dropped to only 2.9 wagon pullers for every retiree. The math doesn't pencil out. But since when has that stopped Washington? Today, the average life expectancy for a male is 79, while the average female will live to 81. For a married couple, at least one spouse has a 25% chance of reaching age 97. But wait, there's more. You could be living way longer than even these estimates. 
Think how far we have come in the past 30 years with technology. From the floppy disk to nanotechnology, today scientists are using 3D printing to generate new organs out of thin air. Researchers can use human cells scraped gently from your skin to print an entirely new ear, bladder, or windpipe. Science fiction has become reality. Later, we'll hear directly from my friend Ray Kurzweil, the Thomas Edison of our age and currently the lead of engineering at Google. When asked how advances in life sciences will affect life expectancies, he said, During the 2020s, humans will have the means of changing their genes. Not just designer babies will be feasible, but designer baby boomers through the rejuvenation of all one's body tissues and organs by transforming one's skin cells into youthful version of every other cell type. People will be able to reprogram their own biochemistry away from disease and aging, radically extending life expectancy. Those are exciting words for us boomers, wrinkles be damned. We may all soon be drinking the proverbial fountain of youth, but the implications for our retirement are clear. Our money has to be even longer than we may think. Can you imagine if Ray is right, and us boomers live until we are 110 or 120? Imagine the type of technology that will alter the lifespan of the lifespan of millennials. What if 110 or 115 is in your future? Nothing will be more important than guaranteed lifetime income. The paycheck that you can't outlive will be the best asset you own. When I was young, I thought that money was the most important thing in life. Now that I am old, I know that it is. Oscar Wilde. I disagree with you, Oscar. The 4% rule is dead. In the early 1990s, a California financial planner came up with what he called the 4% rule. The gist is that if you wanted your money to last your entire life, you could take out 4% per year if you had a balanced portfolio invested in 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And you could increase the amount each year to account for inflation. Well, it was beautiful while it lasted recounts a 2013 Wall Street foreign a Wall Street Journal article entitled Say Goodbye to the 4% Rule. Why the sudden death? Because when rules when the rule came into existence, government bonds were paying over 4% and stocks were riding the bull. If you retired in January 2000 and you followed the traditional 4% rule, you would have lost 33% of your money by 2010. And according to T. Rowe Price Group, you would now have only a 29% chance that your money would last your lifetime. Or, spoken in a more direct way, you'd have a 71% chance of living beyond your income. Broke and old are two things, are not two things that most of us would like to experience together. Today, we are living in a world of globally suppressed interest rates which is, in effect, a war on savers, and most certainly a war on seniors. How can one retire safely when interest rates are near 0%? They must venture out into unsafe territory to try to find returns for their money, like the story of, their, of the thirst-stricken wild wildebeest that must venture down to the crocodile-infested waters to seek out a drink. Danger lurks and those who need positive returns to live to pay their bills become increasingly vulnerable. Critical Mass Destruction No matter what anyone tells you or sells you, there isn't a single portfolio manager, broker, or financial advisor who can control the primary factor that will determine if your money will last. It's the financial world's dirty little secret that very few professionals know, and of those who do, very few will ever dare bring it up. In my usual direct fashion, I put it smack dab in the middle of the table when I sat down with legend Jack Bogle. Remember Jack Bogle? He is the founder of the world's largest mutual fund, Vanguard, and about as straightforward as a man can be. 
When we spoke for four hours in his Pennsylvania office, I brought up the dirty little secret, and he certainly didn't sugarcoat his opinion or thoughts. Some things don't make me happy to say, but there is a lottery aspect to all of this. When you are born, when you retire, and when your children go to college, and you have no control over that. What lottery is he talking about? It's the big luck of the draw. What will the market be doing when, you're reti when you retire? If someone retired in the mid-1990s, he was a happy camper. If he retired in the mid-2000s, he was a homeless camper. Vogel himself said in the early 2013 CNBC interview that over the next decade, we should prepare for two declines of up to 50%. Holy shit. He kind of bleeped that out, so I don't know how I'm supposed to read that out loud and not like, holy sh, semicolon or whatever, T, apostrophe, anyways. But maybe we shouldn't be surprised by his prediction. In the 2000s, we have already experienced two drawdowns of nearly 50%. And let's not forget that if you lose 50%, you have to make 100% just to get back to even. The risk we all face. The dirty little secret is the devastating concept of sequence of returns. Sounds complicated, but it's not. In essence, the earliest years of your retirement will define your later years. If you suffer investment losses in your early years of retirement, which is entirely a matter of luck, your odds of making it the distance have fallen off the cliff. You can do everything right, find a fiduciary advisor, reduce your fees, invest tax efficiently, and build up a freedom fund. But when it's time to ski down the backside of a mountain, when it's time for you to take income from your portfolio, if you have one bad year early on, your plan could easily go into a tailspin. A few bad years and you will find yourself back at work and selling that vacation home. Sound overly dramatic? Let's look at a hypothetical example of how the sequence of returns risk plays out over time. John bit the dog. John bit the dog. The dog bit John. Same four words. But when arranged in a different sequence, they have an entirely different meaning. Especially for John. John is now 65 and has accumulated $500,000. Far more than the average American and is ready to retire. Like most Americans nearing retirement, John is in a balanced por portfolio. 60% stocks, 40% bonds, which as we learned from Ray Dalio, isn't balanced at all. Since interest rates are low, the 4% rule won't cut it. John decides that he will need to take out 5% or $25,000 of his nest egg freedom fund each year to meet his income needs for his most basic standard of living. When added to his social security payments, he should be just fine and he must also increase his withdrawal each year by 3% to adjust for inflation because each year the same amount of money will buy fewer goods and services. As John's luck would have it, he experiences some market losses early on. In fact, three bad years kick off the beginning of his so-called golden years. Not such a shiny start. In five short years, John's 500000 has been cut in half and withdrawing money from when the market is down makes it worse, as there is less in the account to grow if or when the market comes back. But life goes on and bills must be paid. From age 70 onward, John has many solid positive up years in the market, but the damage has already been done. The road to recovery is just too steep. By his late 70s, he sees the writing on the wall and knows that he will run out. By age 83, his account value has collapsed. In the end, he can withdraw just 580963 from his original 500000 retirement account. And in other words, after 80 years of continued investing during retirement, he has just an additional 80000 to show for it. But here's the crazy thing. During John's tumble down the mountain, the market averaged over 8% annual growth. That's a pretty great return, by anyone's standards. Here's the problem. The market doesn't give an average annual return each year, 
it gives you actual returns that work out to an average. Remember our discussions about the differences between real and average returns in Chapter 2.3, Myth 3, Our Returns? What you see is what you get, and hoping you don't suffer losses in years in which you can't afford them is not an effective strategy for securing your financial future. Let's see how much more we got. I guess we'll just finish up this no, a few more pages. Flip flop. Susan is also age 65 and she too has 500,000. And like John, she will withdraw 5% or 25,000 each year for her income and she too will increase her withdrawal slightly each year to adjust for inflation. And to truly in illustrate the concept, we use the exact same investment returns but we simply flip the sequence of those returns. We reverse the order so that the first year becomes the last year and vice versa. By merely reversing the order of returns, Susan has an entirely different retirement experience. In fact, by the time she is 89, she has withdrawn over $900,000 in income payments and still has an additional $1,677,975 left in her account. She never had a care in the world. Two folks, same amount for retirement, same withdrawal strategy. One is destitute, while the other is absolutely free financially. And what's even more mind-boggling, they both have the same average return. How is it possible? Because the average is the total returns divided by the total number of years. Nobody can predict what will happen around the corner. Nobody knows what the market will, in, will be up or when it will be down. Now imagine if John and Susan both had income insurance. John would have avoided a ulcer knowing that his account dwindled. He had a guaranteed income check at the end of the rainbow. Susan would have simply had more money to do with as she pleases. Maybe take an extra vacation, give more to her grandkids, or contribute to her favorite charity. The value of income insurance cannot be overstated. And when coupled with the all seasons portfolio, you have quite a powerful combination. Six degrees of separation. You might recall from earlier in the book when I introduced Wharton Professor Dr. David Babel. He is not only one of the most well-educated men I have ever met, but also a gentle and caring soul with a grounded faith. And he's, he prefers David over doctor or professor. Here is a quick refresher on David's accomplishments, accomplished background. He has six degrees, a degree in economics, an MBA in internal, international finance, a PhD in finance, a PhD minor in food and resource economics, a PhD certificate on tropical agriculture, and a PhD certificate in Latin American studies. He has taught investment at Berkeley and the Wharton School for over 30 years. He was a director of research in the pension and insurance division for Goldman Sachs. He has worked for the World Bank and consulted for the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the Department of Labor. To say he knows his stuff is to say Michael Jordan knows how to play basketball. David is also the author of Polarizing Report in which he lays out his own personal retirement plan. When it came time for David to retire, he wanted a strategy that would give him peace of mind and a guaranteed income for life. He remembered that income is outcome, and he also wisely took into consideration other factors such as not wanting to make complex investment decisions in his older years. He considered all his options and drew upon his vast knowledge of risks and markets. He even consulted with his friends and former colleagues on Wall Street to compare strategies. In the end, David decided that his best place for his hard-earned retirement money was annuities. Whoa, wait a second. How could Babel commit what his Wall Street buddies call an annuicide? Annuicide being the term that brokers first coined for a client who withdraws money from the market and uses age-old insurance companies to guarantee a lifetime income. Brokers see it as an irreversible decision 
that no longer allows them to generate revenues from your investment, the death of their profits. Come to think of it, when was the last time your broker, broker talked to you about creating a lifetime income plan? Probably never. Wall Street typically has no interest in promoting concepts related to withdrawal. To them, withdrawal is a four-letter word. Here's the irony. You represent a lifetime of income for the broker so as long as you never leave. Americans should convert at least half of their retirement savings into annuity. U.S. Treasury Department. Dr. Jeffrey Brown knows a thing or two when it comes to creating a lifetime income plan. He is an advisor to the U.S. Treasury and the World Bank and is one of the people called on by China to help evaluate its future Social Security strategy. He was also one of only seven individuals appointed by the President of the United States to the Social Security Advisory Board. Jeff has spent most of his professional career studying how to provide people an income for life. What did he resolve? That annuities are one of the most important investment vehicles we have. Jeff and I had a fascinating three-hour interview around income planning and how baffling it is to him that income is omitted from most financial planning conversations. How is it possible that income insurance is barely discussed in the offices of most financial planners, nor is it included as an op option inside 401k plans, the primary retirement vehicle for Americans? I asked him, how do people find a way to protect themselves so they really have an income for life when they are living longer than ever before? They're retiring at 65, and today they've got 20 or 30 years of retirement income needs ahead of them, but their financial plan won't last that long. What's the solution? The good news, Tony, is we actually do know how to address this problem, he said. We've just got to get people to change the way that they are thinking about funding their retirement. There are products out there in economist land that we call annuities, which basically allow you, allow you to go to an insurance company and say, you know what, I'm going to take my money and put it with you. You're going to manage it, grow it, and you're going to pay me back income every month for as long as I live. The easiest way to understand this is, is exactly what Social Security does. With Social Security, you know, you're paying in over your lifetime while you're working, and then when you retire, you get paid back income every month for as long as you live. You don't know, you don't have to be limited by Social Security. You can expand your lifetime income by doing this on your own as well. Jeff and his team performed a study where they compared how annuities were described or framed and how the shaping of the conversation completely changed people's perception of their need or desire for annuity. First, they portrayed them the way stockbrokers do, as a savings account or investment with their relatively low levels of returns. Not surprisingly, only 20% of people found them attractive. Sound familiar? You can hear the broker saying annuities are a bad, bad investment. But when they change just a handful of words and describe the actual and real benefits of the annuity, the tide change. By describing the annuity as a tool that gives you guaranteed income for the rest of your life, more than 70% found them attractive. Who doesn't want income insurance that kicks in if you have burned through your savings? Maybe your cost of living was greater than you expected. Maybe you had an unexpected medical emergency, or maybe the market didn't cooperate with its timing of returns. What a gift to know that your future income checks are just a phone call away. And today, a revolutionized financial industry has created a whole new set of annuity opportunities. Many of these pay you returns that mimic the performance of the stock market but carry none of its downside losses. Annuities aren't just for the grandpa anymore. Turn the page and let me show you the five types of annuities that could change your life. And that ends chapter 5.3. I'll be going on to chapter 5.4. I'm going to try to finish this video right at 30 minutes. That would be kind of cool. Until next time.
I'm gonna keep grinding. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I will always just process. I'm out.